listeners, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Cold. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, I'm tired of being cold. Yeah. Like, we had like a day of nice, and then it got cold again. Actually, um, both today and yesterday, it was almost 60 degrees when I got home from work, so I went for a walk. Oh, nice. Mm. Yeah. I guess um, we had two days. I don't know. It's starting getting colder today, though. So yeah, yeah. Like as the, it was colder this when I came here than it was when I got up this morning. Yeah. So it's dropped throughout the day. Well, I don't know if it dropped throughout the day, but it's definitely colder now than it was. No. Yeah. First thing in the morning. But like I said, when I got home from work, it was it was almost sixty degrees, and so yeah. it like that's warmer than it was when I got up this morning. Yeah. I don't know. Pretty sure. I, I don't know. Maybe I was out in it a bunch, and I thought it was cold. So, and yeah. I didn't think it was cold when I went into work. Oh, well, so. the wind's blowing now again, though. Too. That that may be what it is. Yeah. The wind may be the factor. Yeah. At any rate, it's decided to start affecting my throat. So, uh. this is going to be a fun podcast. It hurts to talk. So. Okay, <laughs> just throwing that out there. Well, um, I plan to. We, but we finally got to a stage where you actually talk. I, right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and now it hurts. <laughs> Anybody who hasn't been around for a long time, like go back and listen to some of those early podcasts where Gary says about five words and the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in our interview with Scott Horton, Scott told him he needed to get on the in on the questioning, and yeah. <laughs> Gary responded, I'm the quiet guy. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> Scott said, the quiet guy on the podcast. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, mm. Times have changed. They, they are changing. Now we can't shut you up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Um, yeah, we don't we don't much get uh, days and days of sub freezing in a row here. Yeah, it's that's, very strange. That's kind of unusual. I mean, it gets this cold here. Like that's not. Yeah, that's not weird. But, but to have like days in a row. Yeah, we don't normally get a stretch. It, is, it seems unusual. Yeah, I don't um, like it. It needs to go back where it came from. I mean, I I like uh, honestly, I like. Um, three days in a row of um, 24 degrees or whatever, much more than I like three days in a row of 102. <laughs> well, there's something to that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that seems to be a big debate right now when you <laughs> talk is. to people here. Yeah. I mean, there's um, there's there's strong arguments on both sides. I agree. I, I, uh, so um, hot, is, uh, hot is uncomfortable. Um, cold hurts. Yeah, but, um, but I can layer as much as I want to deal with cold, and I can only take so many clothes off for yeah. hot. <laughs> right. So I uh, yeah I guess we deal with a lot more hot than cold here. Generally S- speaking, yeah. 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 So uh, no, <laughs> there's no general like always. We always <laughs> you think it's deal always with a, a lot more know. hot down here than it is yeah. cold. Yes, yeah. we get we get more greater than ninety degree days then we get sub 30 degree days okay that's probably fair <laughs> or probably. even sub 40 oh, no. degree i'll days. have to go check the almanac okay <laughs> uh anyway i'd rather it be cold than hot yeah uh, i can take it either way neither are great i want yeah. it to be in the middle <laughs> i don't go through uh gasoline as quickly when it's cold as i do when it's hot really is that a thing yeah because the heater uses the heat that your engine makes yeah. Um the uh, air conditioning requires extra fuel to yeah. to run. Uh, so. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You, did you not know that? I mean I, I mean like I mean, it makes sense but I've never thought about it. Yeah. You like your entire air system could be down for air conditioning yeah. and you'd still get heat. Yeah. Yeah. No, that I knew. Yeah. 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 So yeah. that I knew. Yeah. Doesn't require anything. It just yeah. they just open up like a little vent to the engine compartment. <laughs> to the engine. Well, I mean, I know when I want my car to go faster, I turn the heater on. So I guess that makes sense. Yeah, okay. Because it, it pulls the yeah. That's a, now that's a thing. Uh, it, yeah, like because pulls it pulls more air, like oxygenates more the fuel yeah. more. Well, oh. yeah, it pulls more heat off the motor. Oh, okay, okay. I see what you mean. Yeah. You know the um the first BMW I had where like <laughs> we're way yeah, yeah we're just rambling. Um, the first BMW I had uh, always ran really cold. Like really? it, ne- it, I could drive it forever and it would never heat up to normal running temperatures. Yeah. And so finally I took it to the BMW specialist that moved in over here, um, who died, unfortunately he was awesome. I miss him. Uh, he was a guy that was so busy when he first moved in that I would come in with, um, issues with my car and he would say, okay, 
Um, this is what the problem is. Uh, I will sell you the parts at cost and tell you how to do it. And if you have any problems, you can call me, but I don't have time. <laughs> <laughs> I have time to take your call, but I don't have time to do the work yeah. <laughs> and uh, get paid. <laughs> yeah. And I said, okay, <laughs> yeah. fine with me. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, the, the temperature problem, he ended up finding out that what they had done is they had cut the thermostat in half yeah, so that it would continue to make a contact for the sensor. Yeah. But it wasn't actually Reading. adjusting. Yeah, it, it essentially kept the vent all the way open all the time. Yeah. Um, and he said the only thing that he could assume is that the the previous owner had drink, driven long distances at t- high speeds regularly. Like that's <laughs> yeah. the only reason he could think of to do that, unless he was actually racing the thing. Yeah. And <laughs> wow. I said I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, Strange. Yeah. Oh, I miss that car too. Oh, well. All right. So, uh, change of plans. Yeah. Um, more or less. So, you guys who haven't gotten your questions in challenging me on why I support open borders, you got, Another. I guess, two more weeks, really, because yeah. we got a plan for next week, too. Yeah. Um, so, n- next week, uh, the plan, I'm going to, um, I'm, I'm traveling this weekend to do an interview, which should be the... F- the next podcast on the 25th. Yeah. Um, and it should be interesting. So show up for that we're one going, too. We're going to give any more hints than that or is that all they get? Oh, well, I, yeah. It's going to be about human trafficking. Okay, cool. Yeah. And like a number of aspects of it, I think. I mean, we'll see how the... It's how really going to depend on how, how yeah. the interview goes. Yeah, we'll, f- we'll see how far the interview ranges. Um I mean, I, I sent her kind of a general outline of things that I wanted to uh, cover, and she didn't say, I don't want to talk about any of these things. So, yeah. um, or what I mean is there were none of these things that she replied that she didn't want to talk about or okay. that she couldn't or whatever. Yeah. So um, it should be, it should cover a lot of ground, I, I expect. Um, and uh, this girl's really smart. So, and she's worked with victims of yeah. trafficking, so. Yeah. Should be good. Yeah. Another three hour podcast. No, no, no. I don't think I but I do think that it'll probably be our regular hour. Yeah. Uh oh yeah, I would expect it to at least be an hour. Yeah. Um I don't know though. It depends on how quickly we cover that stuff. Yeah. But so, it seems like a lot of I, I mean, I just don't know. I just yeah. don't know how long it's gonna take. But I, I expect it to be around an hour. Um, but we'll see. It'll be however long it is. Yeah, it'll take as long as it takes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so, and then this week we, we're just, you know, um, Biden's try decided to open up a wider war in the Middle East. So seems like this should, uh, <laughs> we, take we, some precedent. We, we ought to, we ought to talk about that, right? Yeah. So what's going on over there right now? Um, because like I say, I've, I've kind of been following things like, mm-hmm. but I, you, I know you follow this type of thing more closely than me. Yeah, um, I actually want to start with the uh, International Court of Justice. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so South Africa has brought a case um, against Israel, citing the 1948 Convention on the Prevention of Genocide. Actually, it has a longer name than that, but that's close that's, enough. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, it's it's well documented. I mean, like they yeah. they've done a good job in their presentation. So I was going to say, my understanding is is that they've laid out a pretty damning case. Yeah. Um, I mean, I have and I have seen a little bit, uh, read a little bit on it. So I mean, it it looks like I mean, there's definitely we've said for a long time there's a strong case to be made for this. Yeah. So it's nice to see that the people that are bringing it are actually performing the case, like are presenting the correct case. Exactly. So they, um, an important aspect of the, the genocide in terms of the international court of justice is that there has to be genocidal intent. Yeah. Like it can't be accidental genocide. It has to be purposeful uh, (laughs) genocide. Um, and so they're, they're identifying things that we've kind of talked about. Uh, you know, now we're talking about more than 25,000, um, people dead, uh, yeah. maybe. And I, it seems like this is being generous to the Israelis. Maybe a third of them are, um, combatants. Yeah. Which means that two thirds of them 
are just civilians. Yeah, just regular old people. And uh, 40% of the deaths in Gaza have been children. Yeah. yeah. And um, so... I didn't know Hamas was recruiting that many children. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a surprise to us all, really. <laughs> yeah. um, so they're also, you know, one of the things that the South Africans were pointing out is that they're um, using conventional bombs when, when smart munitions are available. Um, obviously, like dumb bombs just kind of kill whoever's in the way. They're not... Yeah. They're, they're very nonspecific. Yeah. Um, and there is smart munitions available, so they could be more targeted if they wanted to, but they've chosen not to. Um, and then, of course, the U.S. Uh, gave them 2,000-pound bombs. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago when we um, uh, Blinken was saying that, you know, we or maybe it was Sullivan, one of those two people, they're almost interchangeable to me, um, was saying that we're urging the Israelis to avoid civilian casualties, and by the way, we're giving them 2,000-pound bombs. <laughs> we're giving them bigger ammunitions, though. Yeah. Um, so 2,000 pound bombs can cause serious injuries to anybody, uh, within a half mile of the detonation. So uh, you're talking about a circle, a mile across that it can cause severe injuries. Um, and of course they, you know, the Israelis have been very specific in their own words about, about having a complete siege, a complete blockade of the Gaza area, um, not Mm. allowing, uh, food, water, energy, medicine. Um, these are genocidal acts, not allow food, water. Well, and that was, to me, that was medicine. the most damning part of it was where they were using the things that the Israelis have actually said, like mm-hmm. using their own language to kind of to Oh, yeah, I have a sampling. The, oh, nice. <laughs> I'm glad you brought the, yeah, yeah. Because, because that to me, that's the most damning thing. When you can use somebody's mm-hmm. words like mm-hmm. against them, like to to show intent, particularly in this case. Yeah. Like that's as that's as good as it gets, man. Yeah. I as mean, far uh, as a case goes. Absolutely. Um, and uh, I'll hit that in just a moment. But uh, you know, another important aspect of this is the Israeli attacks on homes and hospitals, specifically. Yeah. Um, trying to destroy the Gazan health uh, system uh, entirely. Yeah. Which they've mostly succeeded in doing. Um, so then, yeah, then using their own words. Yeah. Um, statements from important Israeli government officials uh, suggesting that they're doing all of this on purpose, that their their goal is to wipe out the people of Gaza. Yeah. Um, so I have a sampling. I, I've got two pages of this. You got a lot. Yeah. Um, but I, I highlighted some some that I think are particularly telling. So um, Benjamin Netanyahu, prime minister, uh, said... Um, in a, uh, uh, let's see. Okay, yeah, it was a it was a letter that was published on X. He says, uh, "This is the war between the sons of light and the sons of darkness. We will not let up on our mission until the light overcomes the darkness. The good will defeat the extreme evil that threatens us in the entire world." Okay, that's you know that I can mean, be interpreted sound, a number of ways. That sounds like propaganda. Though. Yeah, I yeah. mean that can be interpreted a number of ways. I agree. Yeah. Um, he also said. Uh, He's referred a couple of times to the the Palestinians in Gaza as Amalek. This is referring to um, a, a biblical story. And so here's the relevant passage. Um, it is from 1 Samuel 15. Okay. It says, Now go, attack Amalek. And, pers- and this, is, by the way, is in a letter to the soldiers of the IDF. Okay. All right. Um, now go attack Amalek and prescribe all that belongs to him. Spare no one, but kill alike men and women, infants and sucklings, oxen and sheep, camels and asses. Yeah, that's pretty damning. Yeah. Um, the president of Israel, uh, Isaac Herzog, Isaac Herzog, I think. Um, I'm going to struggle with some of these names. Some of them are rough. Yeah. Uh, he says, uh, it's an entire nation out there that is responsible. It's not true, this rhetoric about civilians not aware, not involved. It's absolutely not true, and we will fight until we break their backbone. All right. Yeah, right um, there. there it is. The Minister of Defense, Yoav Gallant, uh, he says, um, we're imposing a complete siege on Gaza, no electricity, no food, no water, no fuel. Everything is closed. We are fighting human animals, and we are acting accordingly. He also said... 
Gaza won't return to what it was before. We will eliminate everything. If it doesn't take one day, it will take a week. It will take weeks or even months. We will reach all places. Yeah. And then um, he also said that uh, that he had, quote, removed every restriction on Israeli forces. Yeah. Which is how they ended up killing their own people, waving a white flag and shirtless uh, yeah. not that long ago, right? Yeah. Um, I actually have some stuff from the, is the Minister of National Security, but I, I decided not to include any of those uh, quotes from him. But <laughs> we get into some kind of weird ones here um, in terms of like their role. Uh, and I left out all of the military guys that weren't, you know, part of the cabinet, like the Minister of Defense. Yeah, and I mean, cabinet it. members are who you really want to, yeah. when you're prosecuting the case like this. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, the, uh, their minister of energy and infrastructure, um, Israel Katz said all the civilian population in Gaza is ordered to leave immediately. We will win. They will not receive a drop of water or a single battery until they leave the world. Yeah. The world, not the world. Gaza. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, he also said no one will preach us morality. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, the minister of finance, um, here's another tough one. Bezalel Smotrich. All right. Maybe. Yeah. Um, he says, uh, we need to deal a blow that hasn't been seen in 50 years and take down Gaza. Now, people made a big deal out of that because they everybody assumed that he was referring to um, uh, nuclear weapons. He's probably referring to the 67 war. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. But it's I, hard to say. Yeah. yeah. Now you're getting in this head. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the Minister of Heritage, uh, Amakai Eliyahu, <laughs> uh, said there's no such thing as uninvolved civilians in Gaza. Um, he, also, he also suggested a, a nuclear attack on the Gaza Strip. Yeah. Um, the Minister of Agriculture, Avi Dichter, uh, recalled the Nakba of 1948. We've talked about that a few times where 80% yeah. um, uh, of the Palestinian population in the new Israeli state was forced to flee from their homes. Um, and he said, uh, we are now actually rolling out the Gaza Nakba. Yeah. I mean, that, that says it right there. Yeah. And then the last one I've got is the uh, deputy speaker of the Knesset, which is essentially their parliament. Mm -hmm. um, and he's also a member of the, of the Foreign Affairs and Security Committee. Uh, he said, um, his name is N Nassim Vaturi, mm -hmm. maybe? <laughs> Sorry on the well. names, people. Um, he says... Uh, now we all have one common goal, erasing the Gaza Strip from the face of the earth. Those who are unable will be replaced. Yeah. So. Pretty strong yeah. case, I think, that their intent is to get rid of everybody there. Yeah. Um, and uh, so Israel has had their chance to defend, and their defense is essentially, but October 7th. Yeah. 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 Uh, but in their opening, the um, South Africans made it clear that the the convention doesn't um, have an exception for if you've been attacked. Like yeah. a genocide is a genocide, and yeah, so yeah. genocide's not not okay under any circumstances, right? Like so that should should go without saying. Yeah. But and I know there are a lot of people out there that's like, oh, there's only you know there's. Uh, Two almost two and a half million people in the Gaza Strip, and they've only killed twenty five thousand. Obviously, they're not really targeting civilians and what have you. But that's about five times as many civilians ha as have been killed in the entire Ukraine war so far. Yeah, might be, might be ten times. Depends wow. on whose numbers you use. Yeah. Um, and that war has been going on for a year and a half. Yeah. No, two years. Two years. Yeah, I think that's right. Nearly. Yeah, February twenty fourth. Yeah, so that'd be right. Yeah. So, um, and this has only been going on for three months. Yeah. I, I, I it's pretty unbelievable to me. They, but their, yeah, their case is well, they attacked us, and yeah, you know, it was awful what they did. And like, yeah, they, no, I and, agree. Yeah, and I mean, you know, it would be <laughs> one thing if they were just kind of responding to just that, but it's clear with with the rhetoric that's coming out of the chambers of power that, that this is more than that. Yeah. Um, I was listening to, um, Colonel McGregor. He was yeah. on, uh, judge Napolitano's podcast. Oh, okay. Actually, I think he's on there weekly, maybe more than that. seems yeah. like he's on there a lot anyway. Yeah. 
but he was talking about um, during the tank battles in the Iraq War that they had they had won, uh, the U.S. Yeah. had won, yeah. um, and that they started uh, firing mortars um, just to get the the remaining Iraqis to flee from their hiding positions um, so that they could shoot them with rifles. Oh yeah, yeah. And he said he called it off. He was like, no, 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 we're not, we're not here to kill all of these people. Yeah. We're here to win a fight and we've won the fight. The fight's over. Yeah. And, um, so he, you know, called for a ceasefire and they, they uh, just like took, um, shoot them out. Yeah. And, and yeah. said, you know, come over. We're just gonna, you know, essentially arrest you, I guess, until yeah. this is all complete and yeah. so forth. And he's like, you know, there's five or 600 people. Yeah. But that were left, you know, at that point. Yeah. But and these are soldiers. Like these are people that were actively fighting. <laughs> you, know, yeah. you know, there's there's a level where it's it's no longer reciprocal. You know, yeah. at, at some point it has to be balanced in some way. Yeah. Um you've killed 20 times as many people as they killed. Well, especially when you have the upper hand. Yeah. Which is the case with Israel and Gaza. Like yeah. I mean, it's clear who has the upper hand here. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. I mean, the you know, the other thing that just has to be pointed out every time is that Gaza is not a nation. It's not the nation next door to Israel. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is under Israeli control. It's been under Israeli blockade for years. Um, and it's been under Israeli military control for decades. Yeah. And uh, it's, you know, it, it's like, um, I don't think it's unfair to say that it's like, uh, you know, if the U S surrounded an Indian reservation and didn't let food and water and so forth in, I don't think any of us would say that that was not a a genocide. Um, the, uh, I, the example that Scott Horton keeps using is it's like a prison. Yeah. Is like you, you responded to a prison riot by trying to uh, eliminate everybody in the prison. So by definition, this would be more of a civil war, right? Yeah, I would say. I mean, that's that's kind of my take. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Yeah. yeah, it's it's a, it's an internal conflict. Yeah. Um, but it's a it's an occupied people. Yeah. Because, you know, technically speaking, Israel doesn't own the Gaza Strip. The Gaza Strip technically still belongs to Egypt, even though Israel has controlled and occupied it for all this time. Oh, okay. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Um, I mean. It may not be de jure Israel, but it's de facto Israel. And and the yeah. point is, it's not like, you know, the easy answer here would be to give that land back to Egypt. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, you don't right. want responsibility for this. You don't want these people part of your country. Then give the land that you already took from Egypt back to Egypt. Yeah. Um, Egypt doesn't want all the Palestinians. But Egypt doesn't want all the Palestinians, I think, because the way Israel is trying to get rid of the Palestinians, get... Egypt to take the Palestinians is to move all of the Palestinians out of Gaza yeah. into Egypt. Yeah. And then Egypt knows that they never get their territory back. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, so obviously, you know, both nations in this case, Egypt and Israel are more concerned with the land than the people well, on it, it. It does. It does seem like that would be kind of the solution though, is to just, just, Turn control over that area over to Egypt. Yeah, and out of it, it wouldn't hands. solve the problems though, because the those people in Gaza are already refugees. Yeah, um, what they want is to return to the land that they were driven off of inside of Israel. Yeah, it it wouldn't stop it completely, but it would. It seems to me, at least, it would at least stop the Israelis from being able to just like dominate them the way they are. Yeah. I mean, if you if you gave that security um, type of thing over to Egypt and made them responsible for it, of course, then I guess there's not a whole lot of incentive for them to do a good job at it. Well, they, I mean, then the border would just open up, and I mean, I don't know how many of the Gazans would stay there. Like I said, the, a lot of yeah. them, their goal isn't, their goal is to get their property back. Yeah. They're, they're already refugees. Yeah. Um, uh, like I say, I don't know, it's just... Yeah. Something's got to be better than what we're doing. 
Oh, that's <laughs> okay. I can't argue with that. I mean, I'm just saying, like, I mean, there's got to be, I mean, there has to be some kind of solution to this at some point. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know what it is or how we get there, but yeah, like, I mean, we can't continue the way we are. Um, I mean, I, I still say that the best thing is to try and go back to a two state solution. Um, just yeah, but um, didn't Netanyahu come out like just this week and reiterate that that's like not on the table? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if he came out this week and reiterated it, but I, it was, I thought I, I saw that. That it certainly could be. I mean, it's yeah. it's not it's not a new statement. Yeah, I guess is my point be, there. It's yeah. like you know, um, they're not given. They want that land. Yeah, they yeah. think God gave it to them. Yeah, can't argue with that. <laughs> There's some arguments to be made. <laughs> uh, but <clears throat> so that kind of leads us over to the Yemen thing, you know, from one genocide to another. Yeah. Um, the And the reason I say that is because we have to remember that in Yemen, well, there's a bunch of history that's relevant here. First off, um, the Obama administration originally was supporting the Houthis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ansar, Ansar Allah is their official name. Okay. So they they were fighting AQAP, Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, and um, and the U.S. was supporting them in their fight against AQAP because Al Qaeda, remember, they attacked us. They're the bad guys. Yeah. Used to be. <laughs> yeah, well, they were. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, but what happened was that uh, Obama signed the JCPOA. With Iran, also making the world a safer place. This is the best thing that Obama did in office. I don't have a lot of like good things to say about Obama's actions in office, but that was one. Yeah. Um, opening up with Cuba was also, you know, a good one. But yeah. um, anyway, so he made the deal with Iran. Saudi Arabia was upset. Yeah. And so, in order to placate the Saudis. His words. Yeah. Placate the Saudis. We switched sides in the war. Yeah. Um, Saudi Arabia and the UAE were both employing Al Qaeda militias to fight against the Houthis in Yemen. Yeah. So we switched sides from the Houthis fighting against Al Qaeda to the guys that were fighting with Al Qaeda against the Houthis yeah. to keep the Saudis happy. Yeah. Uh, that war was with, okay with american support the saudis and the uae um mercilessly bombed yemen and blockaded yemen from 2015 to 2022 yeah and that was also a war of genocide us was providing munitions us was providing targeting information and the saudis were bombing um livestock we're bombing water treatment plants. We're bombing hospitals. Yeah. We're trying to destroy all civilized infrastructure. Yeah. Um, 377,000 Yemeni died in that war. Good night. And 60% of them died from starvation or disease. Yeah, not even the bombs. Mm -hmm. So more than 200,000 people died from starvation and disease as a result of the blockade and the bombing campaign. Yeah. That the U.S. supported. Yeah. So the reason that the war ended, the UAE dropped out of it a while ago. Um, I think they just kind of had enough. Yeah. I, there were real reasons. I just don't remember now. But the Saudis made a deal with uh, a, a ceasefire, agreed to a ceasefire with the Yemeni in 2022. Um, and the reason was that through the course of this war, first off, the Houthis just got stronger. Yeah. I, I mean, got more capable I guess I should say, not stronger exactly, but more yeah. capable militarily. And so by the end of it, they had gotten really good at using drones to disrupt um, oil production in Saudi Arabia. They were uh, yeah. attacking the oil production infrastructure and doing a lot of damage. Yeah. And uh, that was what prompted the Saudis to, to agree to a ceasefire with the Houthis. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, and that's why the Saudis right now are telling the U S to just like calm down a little bit because they don't want their infrastructure attacked again. Yeah. And it's bizarre for the, 
like what a turn for the Saudis to be asking us to to chill <laughs> yeah. out a little bit in right. Yemen. Um, so the Yemeni, the Houthis uh, specifically, um, have been attacking shipping uh, to and from Israel oh, okay. since the the war in Gaza began. Yeah. And they say, you know, they're standing in solidarity with their, um, you know, Palestinian Arab brothers and yeah. et cetera. Um, and that they will continue to attack shipping going in and out of Israel, Israeli related shipping uh, until the slaughter in Gaza ends. That's what they've been saying. Yeah. Just as a side note on this um, uh, convention on the prevention of genocide. Yeah. Which I, I should also point out that both um, South Africa and Israel are signatories to, which is why this can be brought up in International Court of Justice. Uh, they There is a requirement to um, to do everything that you can to prevent a genocide. So actually, I feel like the Houthis could make a case that they were doing what they could to prevent genocide by <laughs> trying to blockade right. Israel, who's committing a genocide. And, yeah, there's definitely yeah, an argument in, there. Uh, right? In Gaza, yeah. Um, that's not the case they've made though. <laughs> yeah. I'm just saying, I feel like that might've been more effective, uh, considering the, the case brought in the international court of justice. Yeah. So, um, at this point, the, the president of the United States used some power that he's claiming to launch attacks with the UK into Yemen to protect shipping for another country. <laughs> Okay. Right. Yeah. So, um, the response to that, I don't know what the expectation was. And actually Biden has since then admitted that attacking the Houthis is doing nothing. Uh, initially they said that they'd significantly, significantly compromised this Houthis ability to launch these attacks. And then they launched a few more, right? Yeah. yeah the Houthis um, did. Yeah. The Houthis yeah. did too. And the U S did as well. And, and there was, a uh, um, all of a sudden we're at war here and we don't even know how we got here. Yeah. There were some officials that, told the New York Times that they had had they had affected maybe 20 to 25 percent of the the Houthis ability to launch drones and missiles yeah um, and said that the you know the the Houthis weaponry is um, easily moved and easily hidden yeah making yeah. this really difficult oh yeah I mean then we're gonna have to go in there if we really want to fight this like we're gonna have to go in there and really fight it yeah um and I don't know I guess th I'm not sure who told who that maybe what would happen is the u s and the u k would launch these attacks and the Yemeni the Houthis would stop yeah that it's since when does that ever work yeah Admiral Kirby uh the national security council spokesman sp spokes liar <laughs> yeah um he said uh, that we don't want a war with the Houthis. Yeah. Like, what did you, th like, you just dropped a whole bunch of bombs <laughs> in their country. What did you think was going to happen that they were going to say, oh, okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, like, that's just not how this works. This is clearly an act of war. I don't understand, I don't understand the logic in this. And since then, the Houthis have expanded, actually, their attacks in the Gulf of Aden and the Red Sea to include uh, American and UK shipping as well. Yeah, because now we're a part of this. Right. <laughs> and we now we're them. fair game, yeah. Um, so the the thing that probably sh we should spend a little bit of time on um, is how they're trying to justify the president's ability to do this Yeah. without Congress. Yeah, and this... This one always baffles me because, like, they do this. I mean, going, I mean, I don't know, going as far back as Bush as far, I mean, not Even Bush, farther um, than that. Clinton. I know it goes further than that, but I specifically remember Truman. Clinton. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, well, we was, haven't I was declared alive war. And, I was alive yeah. and paying attention when Bush, or when um, Clinton was doing it. Yeah. Um, the, the U.S. has not declared war properly since World War II. Yeah. But we've bombed a lot of folks. Yeah, we've been at war constantly <laughs> since then. Yeah, but we've only we haven't declared war since but World just, War II. To me, I I just don't I've never understood how we can like just do these things. I mean, other than the the at the end of the day, kind of what I always say is you know the 
A constitution isn't nothing but a piece of paper. Right. And the piece of paper can't stop anybody from doing anything. Yeah, that, uh, that's true. I mean, in, in this case, also, you have another layer. Now, this is a layer that I don't personally particularly care about, but uh, Yemen is a m- member of the United Nations also. Yeah. And there was no Security Council resolution or any permission from the United Nations for one member to attack another member. Yeah, right. So internationally, I, I don't There should see, be repercussions. Yeah. And that's something to point out about the, the International Court of Justice thing, just to go back to that really quickly. Um, there won't be a decision about whether genocide has occurred for probably a couple of years. Which means the genocide could be completed. Well... Potentially. But what South Africa is pushing for is the UN to put a stop to the to the violence. Immediately. Yes. Yeah. Um problem there, of course, is that who enforces that? We do. The United States. Yep. And the United States is all in with Israel. Oh yeah. So I, I don't know what happens if yeah. they say we we make a resolution to stop this violence. In the same way that with the US attacking Yemen. If the UN says, hey, this is illegal, you can't do that, who's going to stop us? Exactly. <laughs> the UN army. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, you don't have yeah. one. <laughs> right. I mean, they've got a few people, but the United States is the bulk of the military force for the United Nations. So Exactly. Um, but the, the a couple of ways that they're trying to claim that people are claiming that the president has this authority is one under the War Powers Resolution of 73, which um, which says that the if the uh, the U.S. is threatened, the president can take action and bring it to Congress later. Oh, yeah. Right? So I'm sure he's, now, he's preparing his argument to Congress now, right? Of course, the U.S. wasn't attacked until after we attacked them. Yeah, because we were doing it on behalf of, a, uh, for Israel. For a foreign yeah. nation. Yeah. So that doesn't cover it anyway. So it doesn't cover it, yeah. Yeah. The U.S. wasn't threatened. An yeah. ally was. But that's not what the War Powers <laughs> Resolution says. All right. Uh, also, um, the even the existence of the War Powers, like the, the legal, legality or the constitutionality of the War Powers Act is, is questionable anyway. Yeah. Um, because the the Supreme Court has maintained when it has come up that Congress, or actually any branch of government can't delegate its powers to another, or abdicate its powers to another branch of government because it, it ruins the balance of of power. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it ruins the checks and balances that our government is set up on. Yeah. So the only thing that the Constitution, the only people that the constitution gives the ability to declare war to is the congress yeah not they they can't say well you know the president can go ahead and start acting on a war and then come to congress that's not how it works (laughs) all right um but nobody's nobody's challenged it here anyway uh the other one is that the they're claiming legal authority to launch the attacks in Yemen under the um, authorization for use of military force from 2001, which they keep referring well, back to. They've been using that one forever. Yeah. So remember, that was to to you know track down all the terrorists involved in 9/11. Yep. The problem here is that these no these connection. are the terrorists fighting against the terrorists that were involved in 9/11. <laughs> right. <laughs> Oh man! <laughs> so you're even you're you're on the wrong side. Yeah. Like it, this is this is a, a group of people that's opposed to the terrorists involved. So in I 9/11. guess by definition, this would be treason. I mean, you could I, somebody I, could I, make that. I argument. feel like there's an argument there. Yeah. Like I mean, I'm, somebody could make that argument. That's it's certainly true. Yeah. Um. So the whole thing's a mess. And at least in this case, there are a bunch of Congress people that are stepping up and saying that the president acting in this way was illegal. Well, and something I've got a question about. So the you said that this has only came up a couple of times to the Supreme Court. Who would bring that case? How would that case be? So the idea that we're, well, we're doing this and we're not supposed to be. Like, who brings that case to the Supreme Court? Like, because there has to be a plaintiff, right? Yeah, I, I don't know. I think it would probably have to be Congress, but I don't know. 
Like, so Congress would have to like, yeah, like the, the, the universal the executive branch is, uh, assuming our authority that it doesn't have, man, I wish we had like a congressman up there, somebody that would like, like really like make a case for that and like force that out there. Yeah. Cause I mean, like, t- cause just thinking about it as you were kind of walking through all of that, I was like, well, like who would be the person that would have that authority to bring that case? And I think mm-hmm. you may be right. Like Congress is the only one that makes sense to me. Yeah. I mean, it, they're the ones that are whose powers are being usurped. Yeah. Well, they're, yeah, they're exactly. So, uh, I mean, I guess it's possible that the, you know, some branch of the military could bring the case as well, saying we're receiving orders, but they haven't been authorized by Congress. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, that would be fair. Like a general or somebody like that. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I'm, I'm not, a, I'm not no, me either. It's just when you were running through that, I was like, you know, we've gone because you're talking about 73. Like, this has been like, like, it seems like from here then to now, like yeah, somebody would have, years that somebody, somebody would have like brought this up, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, no, it, it just, they find it convenient. I mean, Congress doesn't want to step up on these kind of things. The, well, no, the, the, there's no incentive for the them The fewer to. votes of any substance that they make, the less likely they are to lose their, well, their seat. I was going to say, I mean, can you imagine the pushback they would get from the, like, not so much the people, but from the donors that are, like, contributing to their campaign if they were, like, a part of something like that? To, like, to bring oh, that to bring case. The case? To yeah. bring the case. No, yeah. That's- I mean, the donors would 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 pull from them immediately. Mm-hmm. So, um, and one more little bit of foreign policy news: uh, Gonzalo Lira uh, died in supposedly. I mean, I guess this hasn't been totally confirmed, but um, supposedly died uh, in early January in Ukrainian custody. Gonzalo Lira was an American citizen. He's a um, now I'm not sure, but I want to say Chilean, okay. uh, Chilean American, um, like dual citizenship, yeah. uh, who was living in Ukraine and he was living in Ukraine before this war started or before this part of this war started anyway. Yeah. And was reporting from Ukraine. He was very critical of, uh, Zelensky, um, and oh, the, can't do that. and the conduct of the, the war by Ukraine. And uh, they got laws on the books about that. Yep, that, that's, and that they democracy does not not put up with. Yeah, that. they don't put up with uh, <laughs> dissent. Yeah. Um. So he was arrested, and he's been in custody for quite some time. And uh, he his father published a letter that he had gotten um, from Gonzalo Junior. His father is senior, okay. um, saying that he had uh um. I don't remember the phrase that he used, but it was bilateral pneumonia. He had, he had pneumonia oh, wow. in both lungs. Double pneumonia, I think is double what he me. said. Yeah. Um, he had pneumonia in both lungs uh, since mid-October. Um, he had a pneumothorax, which is a, a collapsed lung, oh, wow. um, from um, fluid or air building up between the lining around the lungs and the lungs themselves. It like puts pressure on the lung and doesn't allow it to inflate properly. Yeah. Um, collapsed lung. Uh and um, severe edema or swelling, and that it was ignored until the end of December when they finally had a hearing and decided to give him um, some some care. Yeah. And so he was supposed to be going into some procedure to help relieve this, um, but he... Didn't but he, it. yeah, apparently he, or it seems, the evidence is, that, that's available says that he died. Yeah. Uh, in Ukrainian custody for speaking out against the Ukrainian president. Yeah. Political prisoner in, 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 is imprisoned for his speech, yeah. his politics. In the country that, that we're aiding to help democracy. Right. Because that that's just what kills me the most. Like, you, mm-hmm. you, you always hear it. Well, the democracy's at stake. You know yeah. I mean? Well, here's what kills me the most is that there's no evidence that the department, that the State Department or the U.S. Embassy or any, well, I mean, U.S. Embassy is under state, but anyway, uh, that that any part of the U.S. government made any attempt to get him freed. Yeah. He's been in a Ukrainian prison dungeon. Yeah. 
No, I'm not, I'm not going to go. That's evocative. I don't mean to be. Um, he's been in Ukrainian prison for a very long time, and there's no evidence that the U.S. government did anything to get him freed. Yeah. And now he's died there. Well, he's on the wrong side of the argument. Exactly. I mean, that, that's what it is. Uh-huh. Worked really hard to get Brittany Griner out of prison in Russia. Yeah. For an actual crime. <laughs> I mean, not one that I agree with. Again, uh, she's yeah. carrying... Um, Vapes. marijuana or whatever yeah, yeah. yeah uh oh yeah maybe it was just thc well, vapes well, was or THC whatever vapes is okay. what it was yeah um now i don't agree with that as a law either but it's on the books she knew yeah. you know at least it's at least it's something i don't know yeah it's more justifiable than i said something that the president doesn't like yeah yeah exactly <laughs> Only, only barely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like now that I'm trying to make this argument, I'm actually having trouble making the argument because, yeah. you know, the government shouldn't have any say about what you put in your own body anyway. Yeah. But you can, at least, but, I guess you could at least make the case that she was smuggling illicit substances or something. I, you know. Yeah. Anyway, um, but worked really hard to get her back home. Yeah. But not this guy. Yeah. And that was working hard to get her out of a prison against in a rival country. Yeah. Ukraine's an ally, supposedly. We're giving them we, billions yeah. <laughs> of dollars. <laughs> it would like, be really easy for us to have gotten him out of there. I it mean, seems like. I mean, all you'd have to do is be like, oh, look, I, I just don't think we're going to be able to write the check this month. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. really simple. So, uh, yeah, way to go, U.S. government. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, and it's a shame, too, because he was, he was providing some interesting reporting from inside Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. Which, well, less people will be doing now because of just this. Well, I mean, less people, people are already really doing, doing it, it because yeah. uh, the, he... he uh, because Zelensky, they've all been arrested. Zelensky, yeah, Zelensky shut down um, opposition media, uh, gave, gave control to the state over what remained, um, eliminated opposition parties. It's real, yeah. de- real strong democracy there. Yeah, yeah. It's what we aspire to. Mm-hmm. It seems like it, doesn't <laughs> it, it? It does. Like, it really does. So I guess that brings us to the Iowa caucus that I don't really know anything about. But. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it happened. It was it was <laughs> earlier this week, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, Trump, Tuesday, right? Yeah, it was Tuesday. Trump won resoundingly. Mm-hmm. Um, no real big surprise there. Um, yeah, more than 50% of the ballots, I suppose. I, that's yeah, the one thing was, that I know. <laughs> yeah, it was, I don't, as I recall, I don't think it was much over, but it was over 50%. Yeah. Um, which is, is a strong win. Yeah, that's a huge um, win. And surprisingly enough, the DeSantis came in second, mm-hmm. and then Nikki Haley right behind him. Yeah. And then, like, right after, like, it may have even been the night after the results came out, Vivek dropped out. Yeah. Um, which I was disappointed in because and Chris Christie dropped out before the he dropped caucus, out before right? yeah he dropped out before and um, so. Tony Scott dropped out too right he did I think he dropped out after about yeah. the same time Vivek did so um, es- essentially there's only three candidates left is yeah, that correct that should be right yeah unless I'm forgetting about well that. Um, Vivek may as well have dropped out because uh, the last debate only had Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis. So if they yeah. aren't going to let him get up in front of people and talk, there's no sense in yeah. continuing. Although he definitely should have been in debates. I think he was popular enough still to be in oh, debates. He, but, without question, he was. Um, but it's but it became clear, like the establishment has said, that, like, look, these are the two pe- people that it's between to take out Trump. Yeah. Like clearly, Vivek's not taking Trump out. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, they're trying to consolidate the race, and and I look for so even though DeSantis got second his campaign, the wheels are just coming off. Like, yeah. I just don't see it going much further. It's only a matter of time before he drops and mm-hmm. Nikki Haley is the torchbearer to try to take out Trump. Of the neocons? The yeah. torchbearer of the neocons? Well, I, I didn't watch the last debate because, you know, first off, it was just the two of them at this point. And I, the debates that I... Can you imagine are, how boring that would be? <laughs> no, I can't. I, I can't at all. Mm-hmm. The, so, uh, so I didn't watch it. Yeah. And uh, I... I I already think the debates had fallen into the point, except for Vivek, uh, of being um, just a bunch of people airing varying degrees of the same opinion. Yep. Yeah. And I can't imagine that this was anything oh, but that. Yeah. And from the the one thing that I heard about is that they were both arguing over who was uh, more supportive of the complete destruction of Gaza. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, great not, choices. Not, we've not, got. not the people we're we're looking for here. No, I don't think Trump's going to be any better on that. No, I wouldn't expect him to be. Honestly, I, I no, mean, he's already be, the one that moved the embassy on, to Jerusalem, yeah. which was a um, a real uh, finger in the eye to the Arabs. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, what was the other thing that he did? There was another. Oh, he he recognized their annexation of the Golan Heights. Yeah, yeah. Um, which I'm sure Syria was pretty upset about. Yeah. No, as far as that end of it goes, yeah, I, I guess Ukraine's the one that Trump is better on. At least his rhetoric is. Yeah. Um, not, now, in real time, when he held the chambers of power, he was mm -hmm. the first one, you know, to start giving them weapons. Yeah. <laughs> so, so there's that. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's not he's not blameless there either. Yeah, that's one. Uh, so, so I don't know, but it should be. It's like I say, um, should be interesting, I guess. Um, where what's what? Which one is next? Is is it New Hampshire? New Hampshire, right? Yeah. Um, which apparently, um, what's her name is polling pretty well. There. Nikki Haley. Nikki Haley. Yeah. She's, she's looking pretty good in New Hampshire, which is disappointing to me because that's the home of the free state project. Mm -hmm. And I just figured more of the libertarians would be opposed to her, but it's just not enough of us, man. Yeah. Even if we all go to one state. Yeah. Oh, uh, maybe we'll post it on the, on Facebook, um, or post a link on Facebook. The uh, Millet, um, the new Argentinian president, yeah, spoke at Davo. Oh, really? Uh, yesterday, maybe. I don't know. Recently, anyway. Last couple of days. I mean, it's only been gone going on a couple of days, uh, and ha gave a really great speech. I may have to uh, go look it up. I I read it. I mean, uh, I assume that he. Did it in English there, but I don't know. Oh, um, I, I read dub. it though, yeah. and it was it was great. It was like a lot of talk about how libertarianism would save the world and uh, yeah. the dangerous move towards collectivism. Yeah, that the Western countries are moving towards, and and all the benefits that free markets have um, cast over the decades, and the personal example of Argentina yeah. uh, becoming a world power so quickly under a free market in the late 19th and early 20th century and then moving to socialism and getting poorer and poorer and poorer <laughs> and yeah. poorer. Uh, right. It was, uh, it was really good. It was powerful. It was, um, well, I'll definitely have to check it out. That's, uh, and that's, that's what we need. We've just got to, we've got a good message. It's just getting it out to the people mm -hmm. and, and, and having somebody, and this is what I loved about Ron Paul, somebody that can explain it and people understand it. Yeah. Um, because so oftentimes like in us as libertarians, it's just the nature of who we are, but we get so academic sometimes. Well, this one, I, I will, that'll be my only complaint about his speech is that it was a little too technical at points. Yeah. Um, in terms of citing data. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't overwhelming by any sense. It's not like he was but giving. But it was a little heavy on that. Yeah. There was a lot of, but it was, it was it was a lot of repetition of things that people could understand. Yeah. Like before the advent of free market capitalism, that 95% of the world's population lived in poverty. Yeah. And now 5% of the world's population lives in poverty. Yeah. The, and how, you know, if you're looking at a graph of the uh, per capita income throughout the, from the year zero to the year 1800, there was essentially no change. Yeah. And then the institution of free market capitalism um, caused the average per capita income to just shoot up over the next, <laughs> you know, century and a half and yeah. what have you. It's, uh, it, so it, it was a little bit too technical sometimes when he was talking about those things, but he repeated understandable data. Yeah. Yeah. And so, no, I, I'm definitely going to have to check it out. But that's, mm -hmm. like I said, that is what we need. Though. Like, we mm -hmm. need people that can, we just need this message out there and heard, you know. Yeah. Because I think that, I think that the data in this case, but, mm -hmm. but in just the message, it speaks for itself. Yeah. You know. So, um, anything else you want to, uh, to hit before we go? Oh, I think that's it, man. Sorry, those of you that were looking forward to me answering your questions about, <laughs> me and Mike going out of the immigration. Yeah. Uh, you'll just have to wait a couple more weeks, but that gives all the rest of you time to, 
to Chime send in. something in if you have something to say. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah. Uh, I, I look forward to it. I'm I'm excited about. Yeah, I'm excited yeah. about that. But we'll be back next week with the interview, presumably, unless something goes wrong, or like the world freezes overnight and I can't make it where I'm supposed to go, <laughs> which is actually a possibility. As the Arctic blast <laughs> looms. Yeah. Uh, but hopefully that doesn't happen. I'm, I'm looking forward to this interview, and, um, and you should be too. So it, it, that's, that's the plan for next week. And then um, we'll be back to normal the week after that, I, as far as I know. Sounds good. We have a hard time planning ahead, but that's... Yeah, that's yeah. as far ahead as we can look. Yeah. <laughs> and even then it's fussy. <laughs> and in the meantime, you can follow us on Facebook. Uh, you can subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, Podbeam. Like and share, comment, subscribe, um, leave a review, uh, email me anything. Uh, email me anything, anytime. It's <laughs> michael at the liberty mic dot com. And, uh, yeah, that's, I guess that's all the stuff. That's all the stuff, right? Okay. That makes sense. So, um, we'll be back next week when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life's short, live free. Ciao. Later.